Good morning and welcome to this week's programme, an addition to mark the career from IRA recruit as a schoolboy to minister at Stormont in a power-sharing executive. From the archives, the late Paddy Devlin. Paddy Devlin's boyhood in the Falls Road in the 1930s, his recruitment to the IRA, on active service in World War II, misspelling graffiti on the gable walls of Belfast, and being interned for it. How he educated himself in prison, joined Labour, joined the Civil Rights Movement, formed the SDLP, and became Minister for Health. There are echoes in this morning's programme of northern politics of 26 years ago, when Brian Faulkner led the Ulster Unionists into the first power-sharing executive. I'm quite satisfied the party has, dis has confirmed uh, the policies that we are pursuing now on two recent occasions at the Standing Committee and now at this huge meeting of some 748 members of the Ulster Unionist Council. So we go ahead with a renewed mandate. The Sunningdale Agreement and Northern Ireland's first power-sharing cabinet followed. Health Minister was Paddy Devlin. He'd left school at 14. My recollection is that I got a job as a message boy and we were paid, there was no jobs going at that time, but I got one in a little shop and I got four bob a week. And then I must have been particularly bright or perhaps was able to run faster than most other people in the area. So in order to keep me, they gave me five shillings a week. It was a generation ago, 26 years ago, and it was a moment of optimism. Bringing as many of a deeply divided Ulster Unionist party into that executive was First Minister Brian Faulkner. You're going to see a coalition government that is streamlined, effective and efficient. William Whitelaw, Northern Ireland's first Secretary of State, expressed cautious optimism. There's always a danger when you make a good start. That everybody thinks that everything's over, that's it, all will be well. I must warn that all will not be well. We've made a start on a very difficult process and a lot of time and a lot of statesmanship will be needed to make sure that it really works and really sticks. Last night, the elected representatives of the people of Northern Ireland reached an agreement which offers hope to all of us who seek earnestly for peace in this island. The then Taoiseach, Liam Cosgrave. The occasion of this agreement is an historic and significant one because it marks the establishment for the first time in the history of Northern Ireland of an administration representative of and supported by each of the communities there. This is an important and necessary first step in the development of political institutions which can bring lasting peace to the North and to us all. Paddy Devlin died earlier this year, and this morning's programme is about his remarkable political journey, reflecting, as it does, a lifetime of learning about politics from the nationalist side in the North. His story has echoes, especially this week, to current events. Listeners can make those links as they wish. After being nominated to the power-sharing executive, he took up his duties as Minister for Health. One unionist checked out of hospital in protest. When we were elected, my office was in uh, Dundonald House, and at the time, very few of the people, apart from the civil servants, a better, uh, uh, there were very few of the other people spoke to me. The security crowd who were who were to defend me, they refused to talk to me. They hit me, hated me that much. But luckily enough, I had two policemen who become friends of mine. And they sat beside me the whole time. And then gradually the civil servants were won over. So much so that when I left, the uh, civil servants in that department actually had uh, a buffet and a drink uh, to thank me for the uh, occasion that I worked with them and, uh, you know, and her. Much they were impressed with my sincerity and, uh, and, uh, and industry. Elsewhere in Ortiz Sand Archive, Paddy Devlin speaks about his growing up on the Falls Road in the aftermath of partition in the 20s and 30s. His mother was nationalist, a supporter of Joe Devlin. His father had Republican and Socialist politics. I remember that at the time, which was 1925 on to 1930, St. Peter's Temple bells rang out every quarter of an hour. And no one used watches or clocks at that time. The bells told you where you should be and what you should be doing as the Reinhardt. That's my earliest memory of the, of the falls. I went on to join, as every other kid in the neighbourhood did, uh, Nafina Erin. And we used to go and drill in the falls park every Sunday morning after mass. Uh, the police used to come up after us and in through Springfield Road and as we were praying up and down the fields, they would come close to us. And the skirts that we had lodged in the trees saw them and 
for a, for a joke more than anything else, they tended to let them come up close to us, and then they would jump down and we'd all run. Now we ran through bent railings and went into the Falls Park, and all the policemen, all big ex RIC men mainly, they ran after us and they ran very ponderously and couldn't catch us. And then when we got up into the where the railings were, we went through the railings and ran into the Falls Park and went on down home. But they could never get out of the fields because the railings weren't bent enough to enable their bulky bodies to get through. There was when I was in the Fina, I was I, I was a reasonably good speller, and I had been I had been drafted into the IRA, and at the time war was just declared and the. Uh, the whole idea was to do something dramatic to record the fact that the IRA were, were, was, were supporting the Germans. So we were all called to a club and were all addressed by the OC. He said, this is our opportunity. We've been waiting on it for years. We have got them at last. They've fallen into our trap. We have got to act decisively against them today. So we... Um, we all were allowed to go home while they considered what action would be taken. So walking home, I was visualising sort of uh, large-sized machine guns and cannons and and, uh, and all sorts of things that that we that would be part of the attack. But after about two hours, I was sent for, and I come back round, and the I was very young at that time. I was fourteen, you see, and I said, "Now we we have got to go out." We're all ready. We're going out now. And I was visualising all this, you know, and wondering where my rosary beads were to get send them to make sure that I would have the same rosary before it all happened. But anyway, we discovered that they had whitewashed buckets and brushes. We went down onto the Falls Road and there was a blank wall, a large blank wall that stretched for about 200 yards. So we... Uh, we're told then by the OC leading us that we were to write England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. So they went up to the top and started the big letters, about eight foot in length. Uh, how do you spell it? England, E-N-D-G-L-A-N-D. So that went down. Difficulty. Oh, Christ. So they tried to write out difficulty and finally got got something that resembled difficulty in, in letters. Ireland's opportunity. Well, Ireland was easily spelled, so went on to opportunity. How do you spell that? O-P-E-R-A. You know, like down in the opera house. Oh, right. Opera. Opera. Does that sound right? Right. The next one. T U N E tune, easy. And what's the rest of it? I T Y. Oh, that's right, that's right. Doesn't look right at all. Try it again. Right, I don't think there's an E in tune. Okay, O P E R A. That has to be right. That's the way you spell opera. Opera. Tune, T U N I T Y. Right. Still doesn't look right. I'll fucking rub it out and put chance down. <laughs> so, chance went on the wall. And in another archive interview with Rodney Rice, Paddy Devlin spoke about his time as an internee during the war. I would have been arrested because I would have, um, you know, been in company of well-known IRA men at that time because one of the tactics the police used all the time was that they had a group of men the one who was easy to follow physically would have been the one who was left out and removed. Similarly, eight men, they, they took seven away and left one. And he, naturally enough, would have caused a gravitation towards him from new people. And therefore, they kept on watching him, particularly somebody of about seven foot with ginger hair and wore glasses and was in crutches. Somebody like that, you know, who would be outstanding physically. And the police would follow that fellow and he would draw three or four more to him and then they would rear arrest the three or, more, three or four more and let this character, this outstanding character, just move about to bring other poor kids to their doom and they would be arrested too in due course. Can you tell us something about your jail experiences? What did jail do to you? Well, uh, when, when I was 17, I was disappointed that I 
wasn't put away for 20 years. That was the first thing. So internment to me was an anticlimax because I had very romantic ideas of you know, how I would like to finish up. And uh, as I say, unfortunately, I was only interned. I uh, learned Irish, taught, I was taught Irish and uh, did pretty well. I got a fania. I haven't spoken very much over the last 20 years or so. Uh, we played football, we read economics, we went through our sums again, learned some arithmetic and catechism, of course, as well. And uh, we generally engaged in, you know, as much athletic activity as we could. And at the same time, we had intensive discussions. I think it was there that I first come across James Connolly and what James Connolly had written about and what, the, what meaning he had for Irish people. Paddy Devlin often acknowledged that he learned his first basic lessons in politics in jail. Before that, he knew very little of the complexity of Irish politics, of Ulster's politics. Prior to coming into jail, that I would have had no real political ideas. I think I'd have been satisfied with the painting of pillar boxes green. And when I got into jail, I began to see extra layers of meaning in the whole thing. And uh, obviously I wanted a better society and I wanted to know what sort of program the Republican Army had for creating that better society. So to that extent, it certainly uh, inspired a new consciousness of what it all meant, and it led me into more meaningful ways of pursuing it. Uh, to that extent, it certainly was of, of great benefit to me, and uh, uh, it's always, as far as I'm concerned, a, a watershed in my desert of, of ignorance about the whole thing. And in another interview with Sam McCautry, he talked about the importance of jail and how it had prompted him to read and to catch up on his education after he'd left jail, including a course at Ruskin College in Oxford, which had courses specially geared for trade union leaders, which he now was. Jail was nothing to me. It was a romance. It was a great place to be. I learned Gaelic and I played football and uh, I, I learned various things that enabled me afterwards to do a bit of writing. So after I got out of jail, I decided that uh, the IRA were using force, they had no economic policy, the no Protestant support and therefore it was a waste of time. So on the basis of th those three reasons I resigned from the uh, I, I resigned from the IRA and then tended to take part in the labour movement and the trade union movement. I become a branch secretary in the, uh, in the General Municipal Workers Union. I was lucky in that I was able to attend courses in Drogheda and, uh, and also went to Ruskin for a three-week course and I went to the TUC in London. Now, by doing that, I was able to build up an education and I, uh, that enabled me to get into politics and I become a councillor, I think, about uh, 1950, 1956. Uh, I was a councillor for several years, a bit Jerry Fit, in fact, in the by-election that took me in. And I was secretary of the Irish Labour Party in Belfast uh, at the, for a time. But they were confined far too much to Catholic areas. And I could see reforms, but not through a, 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 a Labour Party that was doomed to work from the ghettos, the Catholic ghettos. So I joined the, Irish, the Northern Ireland Labour Party, which uh, represented almost all of the constituencies throughout the whole of the north and in time I become the chairman of the organisation committee and the chairman of the Northern Ireland Labour Party. Through the NILP he hoped to encourage working class solidarity between orange and green but Paddy Devlin appreciated how difficult this would be. The Catholic community which he knew best had a deep sense of grievance. The attitude of people generally well it's rather difficult to say you know the still is feeling that they were second-class citizens, that as far as electoral pra practices in the North were concerned, that uh, they were all aimed against, against the Catholic. As far as employment was concerned, if there was any unemployment at all, that they always had the rough end of the stick. But there was a, a docility, there was a submissiveness about it all. They tended to accept it without wanting to do anything about it. And uh, we were always working, uh, you know, in the hope that we would rouse them sufficiently to make their protests, but at that time they tended to be very apathetic and accepted all and uh, didn't even have an inclination to come out to vote because they felt hopelessly, you know, beaten down uh, with the 
or what they regarded as the impossible task of changing the system. And I think most of the work that we would have done at that time was aimed at trying to stimulate some interest, some concern, and some fight back content, and, uh, you know, and we weren't able to evoke it until two or three years later. When you were working all this time uh, in a flour mill, uh, you were a foreman and a trade union organiser, as you said. Um, you were still a member of the NILP. How did you come to get involved in the civil rights movement? Well, uh, you know, again, there was everybody who, like myself, who would have the ideas that we had and they uh, saw the urgent need for change in society, were looking around for vehicles that would help us. And the civil rights movement was an ideal uh, movement to do this because we knew that if we confined the aims of the civil rights movement to narrow con confines, that we could bring in all sorts of organisations in, you see, we headed to uh, bring in the Republican parties, the NILP, the Nicholas Party, the Communist Party, all the political organisations at that time. We hoped to get them in to the uh, civil rights organisation. Even at the beginning we had a number of unionists along as well, and we thought that if we turned it into sort of a moral issue, if we appealed to people on moral basis, that we would have mass support for it, which in fact happened. And if we took it along very gradually, along lines where we got full agreement, that then we could get maximum uh, crunch or maximum crunch power in the area that we wanted it to hit. And indeed, I think you'll agree that the earlier movement right up until 1968 was, uh, was a success and resounding success that uh, graded our, our activities at that time. He was involved in organisation, in leadership and in street demonstrations. I uh, was in all the demonstrations uh, that took place. I uh, represented the Northern Ireland Labour Party on delegations that went to the government at the time on human rights issues. And I was uh, uh, elected to Parliament in February of 1969. Later he was to resign from the NILP and be a founder member of the SDLP. These were among the most successful years of his political career and he enjoyed them, enjoyed the camaraderie. Always, whenever we had had ferocious brawls or barneys, we would have uh, sort of stood back a little bit and saw the funny side of it, and then we would have sang songs to one another. In the park I saw Daddy with a laughing little girl that he was swinging. This was his party piece. We stood beside a sunny school and listened to the songs that they were singing. Then I hurried back for home and somewhere far away a lonely bell was ringing and it echoed through the canyon like the disappearing dreams of yesterday. After the prorogement of Stormont, William Whitelaw became Northern Ireland's first Secretary of State. Well, <clears throat> what first struck me about him was the, uh, we met him in St James's Palace in connection with the ceasefire that the Provies had, if you recall, of June of last year. and. Uh, we went into the palace, looking up at the huge statues and, uh, and paintings, and went into the room, and I immediately took my coat off and says, by golly, this place is bloody hot, and he pulled his off and he says, it bloody well is, and mm -hmm. after that, then we had really got down to business. And um, is that way of getting across to, you know, that uh, no matter what you have in mind coming in through the door, you find that he his army very quickly, and all of the people that he's been talking to are people who hated one another's guts, who just simply weren't relating to one another at all. And gradually, as I say, he began to draw us in and began to talk in responsible, sensible terms. And by his own way, his own versatility, he was able to draw us all together to try to get something uh, out of it. And I think at the moment he's uh, going to leave something behind that may not realise the the potential, but most certainly will do a, a, a very good job in creating a road towards permanent peace. And the road to that hoped for permanent peace was the so-called Sunningdale Agreement, Northern Ireland's first power-sharing executive, led by Brian Faulkner of the Ulster Unionists and Jerry Fitt, first leader of the SDLP. Paddy Devlin was Minister for Health. This was 26 years ago. You know, I was the uh, ferocious enemy of the Unionists for quite a long time, especially since I had been in, uh, interned and had felt that I had been sort of badly treated. But yet, when I went into Parliament at the beginning, there was lots of rows went on. But afterwards, they gradually began to uh, speak with me and, uh, and, and, and the sort of terms that, that, that were not based on hatred. That they, uh, 
they talked and began to like me because of my straightforwardness. Uh, that we had had a rouse and they realised that I wouldn't back down, that I was there to stay, and that I was uh, that I was truthful, I was uh, honourable, uh, and I had lots of guts. And they began to admire that. And there were very few of those unionists that I met when I came into the executive and to take over a position as a minister that, that didn't treat me with, with fairness and friendliness. I did create quite a few precedents when I become a minister because you have your you have your office and you have an outer office where your staff sit to your service and, you, and then there's also a side door which people can't come in to the minister's office directly uh, if he wants them to use that. What happened at that time was that uh, they were quite astonished when I sort of said to them, uh, when I said to them, look, call me by my first name, and says, oh, we can't do it. The permanent secretary wouldn't allow us to do it. I said, I want you to call me by my first name, and that's the way it's going to be, and I'll call you by your first name. That, the work still goes on, and it goes on with this, uh, just the same as usual. The fact that we're calling one another by our first names has nothing to do with it. So that's the way that we went on ahead. But as I was in the office, and I had done an enormous amount of work anyway with people throughout the whole of the north, the staff increased from two to nine. And they, we needed the whole nine people to sort of do the work that I was required. In addition to that, whenever they wanted to appoint a private secretary to me, they, I, they brought the names of six men and they were all Catholics. And I said, what's this? They said, this is for you to select someone to act as your secretary. I said, I don't want males and I don't want Catholics. I want the best I can get. And if it's a woman, then I want the woman. It doesn't matter what religion she is. Religion has nothing to do with this in here, and it certainly won't weigh with me any, a, a one bit. So that's what happened, and I then had a, a, a woman appointed as secretary to me, and she was brilliant. I come from a family which I always felt was a Labour family. My mother was a nationalist. She was mad, Joe Devlin supporter. But my father was a Labour man, and a Labour man in the Falls Road was very unusual because the, the president of his Labour party was a man called Billy McMullen, and Billy McMullen was elected for, for the Falls uh, and Parliament and Stormont, and my father was, was one of his workers. So always, I, I think we were known as a Labour Party, which wasn't green or orange. We, we were sort of independent, and he would have sort of backed, he would have followed that course, and I obviously followed his, his role and his lead in, that, lead in that way. And I knew Billy McMullen, and I knew a lot of the Labour men, so I was a full road man who knew Labour men who lived in the Shankill, and who regarded the, the Labour guy in the Shankill as much as a, a brother, as if he had been sort of born in the same family or out of the same womb. So I, I think to some extent there was an independence there, and the, the matter of division. And society never affected me or never affected my father. So, you know, I, I think that that's what we're talking about. That's where the independence come from. That's the independence man. It's not a ghetto, a green ghetto uh, mentality or an orange ghetto mentality. That, in fact, is a genuine labour uh, mentality. But with the Ulster Workers' Council strike, determined to bring down the executive, there was no sign of the working class solidarity which Paddy Devlin had spent so much of his adult life attempting to foster. Northern Ireland became ungovernable. Public services were collapsing as a beleaguered Paddy Devlin admitted by phone from his ministerial desk. The electricity is uh, finished as well, and or it will be finished uh, by and large before, before the day is through. So there'll be no hot meals of any sort, there'll be no heat of any sort, and there's been no distribution of coal, so possibly people with coal uh, who may have had it in their bunkers over the last two or three weeks and have a bit left can still uh, work at the fires. I would think that I've never seen a situation as bad as it is at the present time because as far as I'm concerned, I don't think that the military can cope with that sort of situation and yet redeploy to uh, defensive positions to protect uh, isolated pockets of the minority if in fact uh, an attack was launched on them such as we had in Bellamina last week. The North was ungovernable. Brian Faulkner resigned. I cannot speak too highly of the spirit in which, as colleagues, we from the different parties have been able to conduct our business. It is, however, apparent to us, from the extent of support for the present stoppage, that the degree of consent needed to sustain the executive does not at present exist. 
nor as Ulstermen are we prepared to see our country undergo, for any political reason, the catastrophe which now confronts it. And a postscript to this morning's programme. The then leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, Reverend Ian Paisley, had this to say after the Sunningdale power-sharing executive was forced from office. Could I say, keep the English politicians out. They devised this act, not Ulster men. Ulster men didn't devise this act. Keep Dublin out. Let Ulster men face to face fix up the future of Northern Ireland. I believe that has to be attempted, and I believe that that can be done. This morning's programme was to mark the career of Paddy Devlin, who died earlier this year. It was based on original programmes by Rodney Rice, Michael Johnston, Sam McCautry, Liam Harrigan, Sean Dagnan and myself, and Paddy Devlin. More voices from the archives at the same time on Saturday morning next. Thank you for listening this morning, and good morning. <laughs> That programme was presented and produced by John Bowman.